I think it's reasonable to say that boredom, to a great extent, is the privilege of modern man. While there are reasons for believing that joy and anger have remained well, fairly constant throughout history, there's reason to believe that the amount of boredom has increased immensely. The world has apparently become more boring than it used to be. Before Romanticism, boredom appears to have been a much more marginal phenomenon, reserved for monks, nobility, and so on. But then, boredom was democratized. Everybody could take part in it. That was also when it stopped being a status symbol. It was no longer anything to brag about, because everybody had access to boredom. Well, there are different types of boredom, and you can divide it in, in different ways. Uh, we can, for instance, distinguish between situative boredom, as when one is waiting for someone, or when one is stuck at an airport, when one is listening to a dreadful lecture, or something like that. Then you have the boredom of repetition, when something that can be perfectly fine in itself is repeated over and over and over again, losing meaning for every single repetition. Then there's existential boredom, where the world is empty, the soul is empty. And then there's creative boredom, which is not so much characterized by its content as its result when it's simply forced to do something new. And in that way, one could say that my book was a result of creative boredom. Uh, Gustave Flaubert distinguishes between common boredom and modern boredom, which broadly speaking corresponds to the distinction between situative boredom and existential boredom. A way of distinguishing between the two would be to say that while situative boredom contains a longing for something that is desired, existential boredom is more of a longing for any desire at all, at least something. And we can also note that situative and existential boredom have different, different bodily expressions. I mean, situative boredom, when you start wriggling in your chair, for instance, you stretch on your arms, you stretch on your legs. I mean, that's a bodily expression of situative boredom, whereas the deep existential boredom seems to have no bodily expression at all. It's as, as, uh, it is as if the bodily expressions in situative boredom tells you that, yeah, you can shake this off because it actually helps to wriggle in your chair. Whereas the lack of a bodily expression of the existential boredom seems to indicate that there is no way you can shake this off. And a German philosopher, Arnold Gehren, has an interesting suggestion that he says that only reality helps against boredom. I think that's a pretty good suggestion. But uh, one can't simply get hold of a piece of reality just like that. The problem with boredom is some other is among other things that one, in a sense, loses reality. So Galen's proposal could seem to be a solution that assumes that the problem has already, already been solved. On the other hand, one could say that to experience boredom is to experience a piece of reality. Boredom is real. And rather than immediately finding an antidote to boredom, there could perhaps be some point in lingering and maybe finding some sort of meaning in boredom itself. It's not possible to completely deselect boredom or any other mood, but one can choose to accept it or flee from it. And uh, Bertrand Russell, he writes that a generation that cannot endure boredom will be a generation of little men. And I think it's onto something. And without the ability to tolerate a certain degree of boredom, one will necessarily live a miserable life. Because life will be lived as a continuous flight from boredom. And uh, the poet Joseph Brodsky provides the recipe that it's hardcore, but it's probably the most convincing. He writes, when boredom strikes, throw yourself into it. Let it squeeze you submerge you, 
right down to the bottom. Well, it's good advice, but it's virtually impossible to follow. It goes against every fiber in your body not trying to shrug yourself free from boredom. But then you might miss that boredom contains a certain potential. In boredom, an emptying takes place, and an emptiness can be a receptiveness, although it does not have to be. Boredom pulls things out of the usual contexts, and it can, it can open up for a new configuration of things, and therefore also for new meaning, by virtue of the fact that it has already deprived everything of its meaning. But this is hard to accept for the romantic. The problem for the romantic is precisely that he cannot accept his own size. He has to be bigger than everything else, transgress all boundaries and, in a sense, in a sense devour yeah, Pascal was right in, see, in saying that boredom That's contains self-insight, or rather the possibility of self-insight. Or as Nietzsche put it, he who completely entrenches himself against boredom also entrenches himself against himself. And I think that perhaps the feeling of loss and boredom can be seen as a feeling of conscience, a feeling of an obligation I had to leave a more substantial life. Perhaps boredom tells me that I'm throwing away my life. And of course, boredom is always my boredom, just as conscience is always my conscience. It's boredom for which I have the responsibility. And conscience is conducive to reflecting on the life one is living. And that takes time. And conditions in contemporary culture are probably not that good for taking the time to reflect on the life one is living. Instead of allowing ourselves that time, we choose to banish us. And of course, one can.